Good afternoon, guys. Um, we're going to give it a few more minutes as people are still trickling in. So um, we'll get started soon, but just a few more minutes. Thanks.
Alrighty guys, I think we're going to get started on the webinar. It's about 5.06 or 5.05. So uh, a few people might keep trickling in, but um, we got a little bit of housekeeping and stuff to do before anyway. So there'll be enough time for them to get situated and get ready to learn. So I want to thank each and every one of you for taking time out of your day to come be a part of our webinar, Not Another Norm, Public Health and Transportation Safety Webinar. This webinar today is brought to you by the Louisiana Highway Safety Commission, the New Orleans Regional Transportation Safety Coalition, and the North Shore Regional Safety Coalition. Um, I'm going to go over a little bit of housekeeping in regards to the webinar. This is a webinar, so uh, you don't have to worry about your mic or your video. Um, none of those are on. Despite this, we do want to encourage you to ask questions and comments if you have anything related to the webinar. You'll notice on your control panel, there should be a question comment section. Over the course of the webinar, please feel free to type any questions or comments that you may have. Um, we'll be monitoring it and we will, act, we will address these at the end of the webinar. So don't worry, we haven't forgotten about you, but um, we just wanna make sure we get through all the, uh, the material and then each one of our panelists or else can address the uh, the actual questions. So um, regarding the webinar, there will be a few things we have to do. There's a pre and post survey that will be a part of this, as well as there will be a few poll questions scattered throughout the webinar, usually following each one of our presenters. So um, we'll have a few seconds and moments for you all to um, do those. And um, right now I'm going to introduce our hosts for the webinar. Uh, I'm Nelson Hollings, the North Shore Regional Safety Coalition Coordinator here at the Regional, Safe, uh, the Regional Planning Commission, and here's Elizabeth. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Morris. I am the New Orleans Regional Traffic Safety Coalition Coordinator here at the New Orleans Regional Planning Commission. Hello, my name is Shanita Vasquez. I am the Diversity Outreach Coordinator and the Occupant Protection Program Coordinator with the Louisiana Highway Safety Commission. Wonderful. So we will be your host guiding you through this webinar today. Uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to do our little uh, pre-survey. So we got a few questions. So if you'll take, uh, it should go by pretty fast, but if you could just answer these and then we'll get rolling. Okay. So I'm going to do this. We've got six questions for you. I'm going to pop them up on the screen. Um, if you can Go ahead and vote, um, and we'll give you 30 seconds-ish um, to fill it out. So I guess I could read it for you all, too. That might help. Um, what is not included with collegiate recovery programs? A, weekly seminar with other students in recovery. B, access to a full-time coordinator. The happy hour beer and cocktail specials from 4 to 6 p.m. or the access to a campus recovery space specifically for students. Okay, I'm closing it now. Um, and here are the results. So we'll, as we go through the webinar, we'll see if 100% of you were correct or 100% of you weren't. Okay, so question number two. Okay, each year, how many college students aged 18, oh, 18 to 24 are estimated to die from alcohol-related unintentional injuries? So is it A, 5,000, B, 8, 1825, C, 753, or D, 182. Give you a few more seconds to get those responses in. Okay, I'm closing it. Okay. So we have people thinking all all four different ones. So again, we'll figure out who's right um, as we go through the webinar. 
Our third question. What is the estimated percentage of students on any given college campus that identify as in recovery from addiction? Is it A, 8%, B, 2%, C, 10%, or D, 4%? Okay, I'm going to give you a few more seconds to get those last minute votes in. Um, so again, we've got it kind of split all around, so pay attention and we'll um, check back in at the end to see who was correct. Okay, question number four. Which of the following is not a possible consequence or penalty of substance abuse? Um, a, a suspended license, B, time in jail, C, fines, or D, all of the above. Okay, give you a few more seconds to get those last minute votes in. Okay. So it was unanimous that it was D. We'll see if y'all were right. Um, here is our Fifth question, so true or false, access to health care and structural issues contribute to health inequities. And it's true or false. About 10 more seconds. Okay, closing that poll. Let's see what everyone said. So most said true, some of you said false, and um, we'll, we'll know by the end. And then our final, question on this pre-survey. Why is it important to include public health in discussions about traffic safety? A, it's what all the cool kids are doing. B, COVID. C, only healthy people drive well. Or D, traffic safety is fundamentally a public health issue. About 10 more seconds on this last question. Get those last ones in. Okay. Um, so it was unanimous that it was D. Um, and we'll see if that's correct. Um, thank you all for, for participating in those. Um, and we will move on now. Wonderful. Thank you, Elizabeth, for taking us through that. Um, before we really get going into more of the, the public health side of uh, traffic safety today, I kind of want to give um, a bird's eye view of traffic safety in Louisiana, as well as the guiding document that, um, you know, really plans out all the work we're doing to reduce fatalities and serious injuries on our roadways around the state. So in the slide right here, you can kind of get a brief overview of what the fatalities 
within the state of Louisiana looked like, have looked like since 2012. You may notice that we don't have 2020 there. Um, this has to do with the, the work that DOTD does related to cleaning the data and such. So usually it takes about a year to get that finalized. So the most recent year we have for fatalities is 2019. And you can see um, based on this graph that we're you know, anywhere between 750 and 700 fatalities a year. So way, you know, more than we'd like to be. And, you know, we continue to bring, hopefully bring that number down. Uh, there are two lines here that you can see. One of them is the orange one, and that is our SHSP goal line, the Strategic Highway Safety Plan goal. And that is to have fatalities by 2030. The red line is a five-year average of fatalities based on the previous five years. So you can see, um, you know, we might not be, based on that line, trending in the right direction, but um, with some initiatives that we're doing um, and all the good work that many of our partners are doing, it's possible to bring it down below that line and keep us on the right trajectory. So it definitely takes a lot of effort and work from all our partners and stakeholders to keep those numbers down. So what is the uh, strategic Highway Safety Plan. This is actually a federally mandated document that every state has to have. Um, it's a comprehensive multi-stakeholder plan that sets goals and strategies to reduce highway deaths and injuries. So basically, this is the roadmap for Louisiana to reduce these um, fatalities and serious injuries. Um, it's a multimodal plan, so that means we focus on every uh, mode of transportation, whether it be motor vehicles, uh, motorcycles, um, bicycles, pedestrians. So we're really taking a holistic look at all these modes here. And it's a coordinated framework for reducing deaths and serious injuries. So what does that mean? That means we're identifying the contributing factors that are leading to the most fatalities and serious injuries on our roadways. So based on those emphasis areas, we're tailoring uh, countermeasures to work on those. Um, and we rely on involvement from federal, state, local, and private sector stakeholders. So really, we're trying to bring as many people into the fold as possible to have a comprehensive plan that's working with many different um, viewpoints and levels of government and other viewpoints. So we talk a lot in the Strategic Highway Safety Plan about the four E's. That's enforcement, education, engineering, and emergency services. So we work with all those partners, but what we're going to talk about today is something that we're increasingly trying to bring into the fold, and that is public health. Um, and then just some logistics about it. The document has to be updated every five years, and actually Louisiana is beginning to undertake that process right now. So regarding um, the Strategic Highway Safety Plan, our vision is destination zero death. So we, you know, the goal is to reach destination zero deaths on our roadways. The mission is to reduce the human and economic toll on Louisiana's surface transportation system due to traffic crashes through widespread collaboration and an integrated 4E approach, like we we're talking about, that multidisciplinary approach. And the goal, as stated earlier, is to half those fatalities by 2030. And as I mentioned earlier, it's a federally mandated document but Louisiana is pretty unique in what we've done in regards to our strategic highway safety plan. We've actually created nine regional coalitions that each work locally on these initiatives. The idea is that we know traffic safety is fundamentally you know, a local issue. And in order to reduce those numbers, we need to work on a local level with our partners and our citizens to reach that goal. Now, these individual regions are their, uh, their boundaries are state police troops. The idea for that is that state police is an integral part of the SHSP, and we work hand in hand with them in regard to behavioral health, I mean, yeah, behavior change. So having these regions designed that way really enables us to work really well with our partners at LSP. And so why public health? Why are we trying to bring public health into traffic safety? As mentioned earlier, traffic safety is fundamentally a public health issue. Um, and public health is a discipline that focuses on improving the health of people in their communities. Much of this focuses on behavior change initiatives. And if there's one thing I've learned over the course of my traffic safety career is that 
changing human behavior is a very uniquely difficult um, work and that we think with all our partners in the four E's that public health is an excellent fit to bring in since they work so much in this behavioral health um, field. And then, as mentioned, they just bring a different perspective to traffic safety. So the more partners and perspectives we can bring in, the better chance we have of reaching our goal of destination zero death. So we're going to move on now. Um, Shanita, I'm going to let you introduce um, our next panelist. After we do a poll question. Sorry, a poll question. <laughs> so <laughs> the first poll question, um, we're going to launch it now, give you all some time to do it. So which region of the state reports the largest percentage of binge drinking? Is it A, Region 1, the metropolitan area, which is the New Orleans region, B, Region 2, capital area, C, uh, Region 4, the Acadiana area, let's see, D, Northwest Louisiana area, Region 7, or E, Region 8, with the Northeast Delta area? Give you a few more seconds, get those last minute ideas in there. Okay, we're going to close it and uh, share it with y'all. So, um, about 50% of you said it was Region 2, the capital area. Then we had 25% say Region 4, the Acadiana area. Region 7 got 13%, and Region 1 got 13%. So pay attention to this next um, presenter, and she will let you know who got that correct. Okay. Introduce our presenter. We are pleased to have Dr. Allison Smith um, as one of our guest panelists on here. Dr. Smith um, works at the Louisiana Board of Regions works at the Louisiana Border Region. She is a native of Baton Rouge. She received her psychology degree from Southern University, Baton Rouge, in 2009. She later went on to receive her Master's of Public Administration from Louisiana State University. Following that, in, in 2016, Dr. Allison received her PhD in Educational Leadership research and counseling with a specialization in higher education administration. So Dr. Allison was busy in her educational path. Um, Dr. Allison currently oversees statewide core, core survey administration, which she was gracious enough to take time away from that um, this evening um, to be on this um, forum with us. She provides professional development training, facilitates campus community partnerships, and renders technical assistance around the issue of substance use prevention in Louisiana collegiate communities. Dr. Allison has experience including in internship with both NERDS Family Partnerships and the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration in the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention. She has spent the last 10 years working in the field of substance misuse, prevention and recovery in higher education, with eight years of those um, being spent in Louisiana State University before going over to the Louisiana border region. I have seen Dr. Um, Smith's presentation previously, and you guys are in for a treat. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Smith. Thank you, Shanita. Thank you all for inviting me, for having me. Wow, I didn't know you were going to read the whole bio, but <laughs> that will save us some time as we go through. But thank you all for having me. Um, one, um, I have a few data slides I'll share with you. Not too many. We'll keep it light. We'll keep it fun. So we'll go ahead and get started. So uh, I'll blow through my intro. She read a lot of it. I'm a native of Baton Rouge. I'm the youngest of seven kids. I can live off a diet of hot wings and crawfish if it wouldn't kill me. Um, I'm a 2009 graduate of Southern University with a bachelor's in psychology. I graduated with my master's from LSU 2011, and I got my PhD from LSU in 2016. Um, personally, a few things about me. I'm still upset about a couple things. One, that girlfriends never got a proper ending, that I, they wasted seven, season, seven and a half seasons worth of Game of Thrones, 
And that I don't know if I want Issa and Lawrence coming together in season five. It's going to be the last season of Insecure. So some background about our office is that we started originally in 1998 at LSU after the 1997 binge drinking related death of Benjamin Wynn. Um, if you're familiar about three years ago at this point, almost three years ago, two and a half years ago, LSU was back in the same position with the death of Maxwell Groover, um, a binge drinking hazing related incident right outside its gates again. Um, originally, we started in 1998, our LSU was a part of the Robert Wood Johnson's Foundation's A Matter of Degree program, where they gave money to 10 institutions to focus on environmental strategies to reduce high-risk binge drinking. And all environmental strategies really is code word for its policies. What kind of policies, strategies, or programs can we put in place to change people's behavior quickly? And so, like, each and every one of us has a really, we have a song that is near and dear to our heart, a favorite song that a lot of people don't like, but you cannot convince us that song is not one of the top 10, if not the best song in the world. So instead of trying to individually convince people to change their behavior one person at a time, environmental strategies like policies allow us to shape behavior of a large group of people at one time without having to individually convince people. Will everybody follow all the rules all the time? No, but if you put a policy in place, more people are likely to follow it than they are to break it. And so I'll just show you a very recent example of that. Over this summer uh, with COVID restrictions, the governor changed bar operation hours. So at, they had to close at 11. They had to stop serving uh, alcohol at 11. So it's not to say that people don't drink after 11 p.m., but we know as the night gets later, the more intense drinking can become. And so one of the ways they try to cut down on some of the negative effects that comes from substance misuse is that we can stop the time, that we can limit the amount of places that you can get alcohol then we can mitigate some of those negative consequences as well as help uh, decrease the rate of transmission for COVID. So that was one of the policy change, which was an environmental strategy. Instead of telling everybody, that was a lot easier to tell the bars they couldn't sell after 11 than trying to tell everybody not to buy after 11. And so we were at LSU for 20 years. And then after the death of Maxwell Groover, the Board of Regents and our governor realized we had nothing at the state agency that focused on prevention in higher education. So our office moved over to the Board of Regents in July of 2018. Nothing we do in our office has changed. We just have a, a more support and a bigger bully, put, bully pulpit to do it from, which has been tremendously helpful for being able to advocate for our schools and our staff at the campuses. So what's going on? So we know that I don't think that I think we all can honestly say that we will never rid campuses of alcohol and drugs. We are working every day to eradicate them but we know that they exist. And so that allows us to confront the issue, to provide programmatic strategies, policy recommendations to help our staff on our campuses, to train our students to keep themselves and each other safe. And so we all know some of the negative effects that can come along with substance use. And typically for students, these are some of the things that are across the board, no matter what type of campus that they usually stick out. Poor academic uh, performance, missing class is a huge one memory loss, DWI or DUI arrest, drops in attendance, encounters with campus police, and even sexual violence. And um, one thing, and th there are tons of other things that can come out, uh, withdrawals, um, they can compound mental health issues. What we see in a lot of college students is that um, typically, they're, typically they will misuse substances for an undiagnosed or an untreated or a neglected mental health issue, such as anxiety or depression, that once they find out they go to treatment or something similar, that once they're able to get their mental health issue under control, that they don't necessarily need the mind altering substances. They were actually needed treatment for the mental health issue. And so one caveat I want to talk about, point out about the sexual violence uh, consequence is that uh, rapists are the only cause of rape. It's not if somebody's drinking too much, they had too much alcohol, they're flirting, walk along, with, no matter what they're wearing, the only cause of rape is rapist. And so when I tell you one of the consequences that one, it makes a person more susceptible, male or female, makes them more susceptible. This one, you lose control of your faculties if you're inebriated or intoxicated. So we'll talk about a quick, a quick few data points. We won't do too many numbers, I promise. So for our national, this is from our 2019 core alcohol and drug survey. Any campus in Louisiana that wants to participate in the survey, the core survey, we offer it every two years. It actually just launched on Wednesday of this week, or on Wednesday until February 10th, any of our schools can participate. 
And so part of what we do also, we run a statewide coalition that focuses, we provide professional development, research and evaluation, and technical assistance around substance misuse issues to all of our campuses free of charge. And we're funded by the Louisiana Department of Health to get that done. And so one of the things is we manage a statewide coalition. Our campuses can participate with us and um, they get to do the survey for free and they get to participate with our coalition, whether they participate in the survey or not. And so from our most recent data, we see that uh, for 30 day alcohol use, Louisiana is actually less than the national average. Um, the, most, the most recent national data from 2015 from the core alcohol and drug survey, and this is done through core, the core Institute at Southern Illinois University. Um, one of the reasons why I always get this question, I know I, I get, I thought people in Louisiana drink a lot. They do, but it is certain segments, certain parts of populations. And also when we look at regional differences, sometimes there are regional differences that impact our overall state's numbers. And so when we look at the national average for binge drinking, something interesting about the national average for binge drinking that in 25 years, it has not moved from between 43 and 45%. It has consistently stayed in those ranges for the last 25 years. And so although we're decreasing, we're, we're liking to see that from where we were in 2009 with 36.6 down to 31.5. And we know that they're just growing trends nationally. Um, it would be interesting to see what kind of impact 2020 had on um, binge drinking rates and things like that as more research comes out. But we know there was a growing trend of sober curious or collegiate recovery programs or students who were just choosing to abstain or not drink at all. And so for driven while under the influence, we are higher than the national average, but we've been encouraged that it's coming down. It's almost half from 2000, from 10 years ago in 2009 between the two surveys where it was 33.2, where it's now down to 17.8. And that's through some great work at the Louisiana Highway Safety uh, Commission and their multiple uh, traffic safety coalitions they have throughout the state, which some are more represented on tonight's call. And so another thing that we were interested in is that um, students reporting substance use addiction. As we know that collegiate recovery programs, they are growing across this country. There are about 140 programs, and those are safe, affirming um, spaces for students in recovery who have, they've gone to treatment, they, they're coming back to campuses. Like we said, we know that substances, substance misuse exists on our campuses, and we are working every day to rid that. But in the meantime, we need to have safe, affirming spaces for students who are in recovery, who can maintain their sobriety while they're getting an education. And so uh, I'll throw this up. One of the things is when you work for a state agency or you're grant funded, one of the things you have to do, anything you want to ask for money for, you have to have data for. So we started asking this question in 2019 to start collecting data on how many students were reporting having a substance misuse disorder. So that way we can track and be sure that we're asking for appropriate and adequate funding to support our students in recovery. And so we'll get into some of the regional data uh, comparisons. And when I say regional, this is how our regions are broken up. And the top orange, uh, left orange corner, the north um, west, that is the Shreveport area. Right next to that, the light purple at the very top and the right, that's the Monroe area. And the, the beige looking color in the center, that is central Louisiana, like our Alexandria area. The fuchsia, like kind of dark purple down on the bottom left, that would be our um, Lake Charles area. Right next to that, the green area would be our Lafayette area. Um, the red area is the Baton Rouge area. The yellow area is the home of Thibodeau area. The light blue area is the Jefferson Parish area, Orleans. And then we have Metropolitan, which is the bigger Orleans area. So caveat, we do, we do Jefferson Parish and Metropolitan as one big greater New Orleans regions, because there are actually physically no schools located in Jefferson. Um, and then the purple area is our uh, Florida parishes, our Hammond area, and we kind of refer to them by the more, we call them that metropolis, <laughs> metropolitan areas in Baton Rouge um, in Louisiana. And so that's kind of where our region's broken down. And they're broken down in this way because in short, the Department of Health funds us and this is the regions that they use. And so for 30-day alcohol use, um, that was one of the questions. It actually region one, the New Orleans region. We know that some of the other regions, um, particularly our southern regions, tend to be a little bit higher than our northern regions um, most sometimes, particularly New Orleans. Tend, so don't be shocked, don't be surprised that New Orleans would be pretty high on pretty much any time we look at our region of data. And we talk about social acceptability and retail availability. So how socially acceptable do crowds or students believe use is in that area? 
and retail availability is how how easy is it to buy it? How easy is it to buy alcohol in New Orleans? How easy is it in Florida parishes? How easy is it in Baton Rouge to buy alcohol? And so for binge drinking, uh, again, I told you, don't be surprised. New Orleans is number one again. And typically what you'll see, um, and I'll back up to this slide uh, right here, that you'll see region one, region two, region four. Baton Rouge, New Orleans, and Lafayette tend to run together a lot. Um, party towns, uh, college towns. And that is a big part in that. Um, one, one of the things we encourage, so I'll say this, you won't see every region represented on the map. And so you don't see region three, you don't see region five or region six. The reason why you don't see a region is if there was either one or zero schools participating in that region. So if it was only one school, it would be that school's data and we don't share individual school data. On our website, you can find our statewide data, and then you also can find our regional data. But we do not publish or share at all institutional data. So if, and then also, I won't even tell you if a school participated. Um, that is part of our confidentiality, our anonymity agreement with the universities. But what you can do is you say, hey, I want to know if North Shore participated or if Southeastern participated. I won't, I won't tell you, but I'll say, hey, here's our liaison at two campuses that you asked about. You feel free to follow up with them. They are free to tell you whether they did or did not participate. They're free to share data with you. We just cannot do that. And so if you need to reach out to a campus, feel free to um, send me an email and I'll be sure to reach out to that campus for you, make the connection. So for underage drinking, again, New Orleans again, um, where we see that New Orleans, again, there is a, and so one, I'll say this. So one of the really, probably one of the more difficult parts of my job is scheduling this particular survey. So what we try to do is this ask about current user status and that's considered your last 30 days. What we try to do is miss a window where um, Mardi Gras, spring break, St. Patrick's Day, were not in the last 30 days for all of our schools and that our quarter system schools are actually in school. And so when you see numbers like this, like you may see New Orleans, we say, oh, that's probably from Mardi Gras, or whatever. We've accounted for that. That's not from Mardi Gras. That that survey, like, we we were having our survey done earlier this year. It was January 27th through February 10th because Mardi Gras is February 16th, and I was approached that why are you guys having it so early? Mardi Gras is canceled. We know Mardi Gras is canceled technically, but Yardi Gras is still happening, and people are still gathering. So we're trying our best to mitigate that. We know there are some usually some increased drinking periods right with the weeks of up to Mardi Gras. But this is the only time that we can miss Mardi Gras because a month out from that puts us at March 17th, which is St. Patrick's Day, which starts putting us into spring breaks. And so what we try to do is we try to uh, remove any um, with spikes in drinking time. So we, if we did a survey and say, what was your drinking on last Saturday? If it was the national championship football team game and your team was playing, we know that we would see an increased spike. So we wouldn't do it on that day. So we try to pick what are current, static, normal drinking or use patterns for students. And so for driven under the influence, Florida parishes, that region was the highest. And so one of the things we've been seeing that with, across the regions has been going down some with the, um, the prevalence of ride share apps like Uber and Lyft. Those things they mitigate the need to have to drive. That you can you don't you can call you can call a friend or you can call an Uber or a Lyft home. And then also we know that distance uh, plays a factor in that. If you can drive, you can walk from like you come campus or from a nearby apartment. You can walk to like a cluster of bars or clubs or something. That mitigates the need to drive. That reduces that need. But if you have to drive it 20 minutes into town to get to wherever you and your friends like to hang out that increases the likelihood that people will drive under the influence. And so for students who reported being in recovery, we actually saw more students in the Baton Rouge area reported being in recovery. And again, I talked about collecting these things so that we can start to um, compile resources for students in recovery. And I know, and I saw, I knew that Southeastern would be on the file, but I'm so excited that you all get to hear from Annette um, newton Bowen from Southeastern. And I'm pretty sure she'll mention something about this. And so my job for the campuses basically is how can we help you in any of our other state agencies, partners, any student groups that we can help, how can we help you? 
and we serve as a connector for all of our campus community coalitions and anyone else who would like to help keep students safe from substance misuse. And so some of our program programming initiatives we've done before, um, we've done a lot of social norms campaigns. And so what social norms are, they are taking correct data and presenting it in a way to your audience that destroys the notion of what they believe the norm is. So if someone drinks and all of their friends drink, they drink every day and all of their friends drink every day and they only hang around their friend, friends, the perception becomes that everybody drinks every day. No, you're for you and your five friends, maybe out of 25 people. So that's one fifth. That's not 100 percent. So being able to show the entire data set of picture. And so some of the things we've done, um, we've worked with um, a pro we uh, partnered with the Mass Comm Department at LSU a couple of times. One of our social norms campaign was who will I will. And they did a blood drive. And what was really interesting is that this group, um, it was a group of graduating PR seniors. They were public relations seniors. This was their senior project. What they in their research, they found that one of the biggest groups that needed blood transfusions or infusions were 18 to 25 year olds. And the big, the reason why was from drunk driving accidents or car crashes. And so what they wanted to do, knowing that they said, well, we know that we are pulling on the supply. We want to get people to donate back to that because we know that our age group is pulling from that. We want to get young people to donate back. And so they did an amazing program. They were able to get people to get blood. This is, I believe, the first year was Bayou Country Superfest. The Country Superfest, they got people to give them two free tickets front row. They had a VIP suite, all kind of things that they were able to give them for free. And so they got an amazing experience and some amazing materials to take with them upon graduation. Um, another one of our projects we've done, um, Social Norms Projects, was um, Know Your Limit. Again, there was another group of students. The bottom picture you'll see um, terrified me. I was seeing in the morning a little bit more in a second, but in the top left corner, you'll see the red solo cup, uh, beer, wine, and liquor, those lines on a solo cup, that's the actual pouring size. And what we found, and part of what we talked about in our research with that group, they realized that students tend not to count drinks, they count, they count cups. So if your cup is this big or this big, they say I have one cup. And so one, they did some education teaching the campus community how to count drinks and teaching them what Ben's drinking was. So if you have a drink of to whether beer line is, but it's liquor, you've actually had about three, you've had about five drinks in one cup. So teaching them and helping them understand what is Ben's drinking so that they can know not to do that and how, and then they didn't know how to survive spring break, what to do if someone has an alcohol poisoning or a drug overdose, they did those things. And they taught their uh, fellow students how to recognize those signs. And then their last event down at the bottom, they took over a local bar here in Baton Rouge and they did um, alcohol awareness trivia. And they gave away a trip for four for spring break to from studentcity.com and they gave away a trip to Cancun. That was their grand prize. And so we did some presentations with Florida Parish Human Services and also with um, Southeastern working with those groups and the track coalition in Florida parishes. And these were some of the things using some of our data and they did some focus groups. These are some of the uh, social norms campaign, the uh, the messaging they came up with, dispelling some of the myths that no study drugs don't help you cram. Um, if you drink to have fun, if you end up drunk and throwing up all the time, was that really fun? Um, and then smoking uh, marijuana to relax, it can actually make you more paranoid. And then drinking with my friends, you can also be, you can also, death can also occur. And so these are some of the messaging uh, materials that they came up with. And one of our last ones um, was another group we worked with in Baton Rouge um, at LSU in Capital Area Human Services last uh, year. And these were some of the, <laughs> the um, these were billboards that actually showed around uh, Baton Rouge. 83% of local college students reported not binge drinking the last time they party, and 93.7% um, reported using a transfer transportation service the last time they party. And this is based on research they did as from students at LSU Southern and DRCC. And so um, I'm getting ready to close out, but one of the things I want to mention about health equity, when we talk about um, faces and recovery, um, things recovery, typically now what we see is a large conversation about the opioid crisis. But when I talk about faces and recovery, as I'm saying that, one of the things, the people I'm gonna show you are probably not the people whose faces probably pop up when I say the word recovery. We know that typically when we see information about the opioid crisis, that typically we see that it affects white communities. 
but statistically it's actually rising faster in black communities. And so when we think about recovery, when we talk about health equity and access for everyone to be able to have access to the same resources, which is I'm really proud of our campuses that some of them are starting to build collegiate recovery programs. Um, and the one that's been, that's been built already, they have included equity in their foundation, which has been really cool because um, Naomi Campbell is in recovery, rapper Kid Cudi is in recovery, actor Samuel Jackson is in recovery, Queen Latifah is in recovery, uh, singer Mary J. Blige is in recovery, and Super Bowl champion Tyrone Matthew is in recovery. And so we have to change what we see and what we're always presenting when we talk about faces that recovery. And so access to healthcare is a matter of privilege, and that is not just based on ethnic or racial background, that is also based on insurance or access or money. Do you have money to get to the right kind of treatment options? Do you have money? That is, so I may not have racial privilege when it comes to this, but I absolutely have financial privilege because I can afford to go to treatment. I can afford to seek help. I have health insurance, things of that sort. So understanding that everyone doesn't have the same opportunities that we have and that it's pretty crazy that everybody does. And so um, two options. I love watching Chip and Joanna. I think I'm them. But um, there's always this real part in the show where they find something that that's like, oh, we got a bigger issue than what we thought. And there's always usually two options. One, you can repair before expanding or you can construct properly. So if you have a program or you're building some type of prevention, recovery or treatment program, and you, you already know that there are some equity and access issues there before expanding to any new program, I'd encourage you to fix those, remedy those first before you expand out. And then if you're looking to build a program, I, I'd encourage you to include the equity and access piece before you start building out your program. So lastly, um, and be intentional about doing it. It won't happen by happenstance. You'll have to evaluate your practices and your policies and review your recruitment strategy, recruitment and retention strategies. And that's not just for students, but it's also for staff and stakeholders. And with that, I am done. Please feel free to Either follow me on Twitter, hit me up on LinkedIn, or you can send me an email if you have any questions. Okay, thank you so much. Um, your gift game is on point. <laughs> um, so thank you for all that great information. Um, we are going to keep moving right along now. If you all have any questions for her and you want to have them answered, um, at the end of the webinar, please feel free to write that in the question box. Um, and we'll get to those at the end. So now we're going to go on to our next poll question for y'all. Okay. So, how many fatalities from alcohol involved motor vehicle crashes did Louisiana see in 2019? Is it A, 600? B, 295, C, 542, or D, 178? Give you about 10 more seconds. Okay. Um, so, um, uh, thirty-eight percent said six hundred, twenty-five percent said two hundred ninety-five, and thirty-eight percent said five hundred forty-two. So, um, we're gonna have Shanita and I are gonna fill y'all in on which one was correct. Yeah, it's out. Okay. And this gets um our PowerPoint um going. We are gonna to talk to you about not another norm, public health and transportation safety, consequences of substance abuse. Let's see. Um in one second. 
as always, when something's good going, you have a little technical difficulty. So just give us <laughs> one, maybe about 20 seconds to um, get it together. Oh, I figured out what it was. <laughs> okay. Y'all, it is Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> My brain was not working. Let's try this again. Okay. Um, okay. Um, well, while you're figuring that out, Elizabeth, I'm going to go ahead and um, get started, and then we could just uh, catch up the PowerPoint to uh, where everyone – oh, there it is. Woof, we got there, there eventually. Is. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so not another norm, public health and transportation safety webinar. First, thank you so much, Dr. Um, Smith, for your presentation. Um, I hope everyone got some good stuff out of there and know that we have safety partners that are really concerned about um, our young drivers, 18 uh, to 25 years old, and there's a lot of programs out there that are designed to gather that data and to help you with um, the substance abuse that you may have and to debunk some of those social norms that you may uh, think you have. So, okay, what is substance abuse? Substance abuse basically is like using mind-altering substances to include alcohol and legal and illegal drugs. So alcohol is your um, wine, your um, hard liquor, you know, your beer, things like that. Um, illegal drugs, you know, marijuana, the THC, THCs, the um, hallucinates, things like that. Legal drugs. I know a lot of people don't talk about legal drugs, but legal drugs are also um, a substance and it can be used the wrong way. So legal drugs are prescription drugs, it is also uh, over-the-counter drugs like NyQuil, aspirin, you know, things like that. So it's very important to know what your limit is and to use uh, the legal drug correctly. Um, if you have questions about that, please contact um, either the, uh, the pharmacist if it's over-the-counter drugs or contact your doctor that prescribes the um, uh, legal drugs to you. So next slide. Okay, what are penalties, penalties for um, abusing uh, abusing legal or illegal drugs or um, substance or alcohol? So a lot of people don't know. You go out there, you start, and you, you're drinking, and you get pulled over for a suspected DUI. You get into a car, car crash for a suspected DUI, and you have to go before the judge. So if you're convicted, you would get either a misdemeanor or a felony upon your record. So what goes along with that? Fines. So the judge has the option to put fines on you. Fines can be anywhere between $50 to $1,000. So for making a decision of not being responsible using a ride share service or uh, staying at home and drinking or just um, limiting your drinking, you can be fined between fifty to $1,000, okay, jail time. You get, um, you get uh, convicted of uh, DUI or um, uh, some type of substance abuse, you get jail time. Jail time can be from 30 days all the way to six months. You can also be put on probation for up to six months for a suspected D, um, DUI. So, Again, not having a good plan, not designating a sober driver, or thinking, or even the still coming to peer pressure, things like that, you would either get fined, jail time, or you can get your license suspended. So if you get your license suspended, how easy is it to get around? I mean, yes, we have Uber and things like that, Lyft and things like that, but that costs money. So trying to get to school or trying to get to your job or to your parents' house or something like that. So you have a suspended license, you cannot legally drive. So that limits your access. I mean, there is public transportation, but it's nothing like getting in the car and going when you want to and not have to worry about somebody to come pick you up or if you have enough um, money for an Uber or, you know, walking, being a pedestrian, safely walking up and down the roads trying to get to, to, trying to, get to and from 
uh, your location. What else can happen if you, um, for consequences of substance abuse? Community service. Community service can range all the way up to 240 hours. So just imagine if you're already working a full-time job, you have other obligations, then you have to add on community service to that. Um, there's also uh, substance abuse programs that you would need to go through um, and driving improvement programs. So things, adding those type of things on top of stuff that you're already doing can be very stressful. So to mitigate things like that and make sure you have a plan. Another consequence or possible penalty that you can face while um, if for substance abuse is being dismissed from your school, jobs, or any other program. So substance abuse can really alter your future because some employment, some employment, you may, when you get locked up at first, you may not have en enough money to get bailed out or something like that, and you may lose your job because you don't show up. Or if your job finds out that you're convicted of um, a misdemeanor or a felony of a DUI, just depending on what your job is, they might dismiss you as well. So for our 18 to 25 year olds, that's school time. So you're in your graduate, your undergrad program. And undergrad is expensive already, just depending on what school, university you're going to, or even technical college you're going to, someone is paying for that. So if you um, are suspected of that or you get convicted of that, a penalty is the school could dismiss you or you, you graduate. A postgraduate program, um, would not, depending on their standards, would not allow you to enter that program. So going to get, being a lawyer, going to get your Juris Doctrine or medical school or any other thing like that, having a DWI on your record could really affect that or any other programs that you may be interested in doing. So, and just alone, just the amount of money and time that it takes um, to try to um, get through this. You know, it's hard on yourself, it's stressful on yourself, it's stressful on your family, and then just the the money costs. Like, you're paying fines, court costs, lawyer fees, and other sanctions that may be imposed to neg negatively impact you. So that's something that money, that's money that can be put in elsewhere to help better your future. So these are just a few of the possible penalties that you could be faced if you for substance abuse. So we're going to talk, I'm going to let Elizabeth talk about um, the serious consequences that you can face, even more serious. <laughs> Thanks, Shanita. Yeah, not that those other consequences weren't serious, but um, I mean, substance abuse and then deciding to drive while you are under the influence can lead to either your um, death or serious injury or that of somebody else. So during one year, so during 2019, Louisiana saw 295 fatalities. So the 25% of you who answered that correctly are in full, good job. And 277 serious injuries from alcohol involved motor vehicle crashes. So that's 295 people that are no longer with us because somebody decided to drink alcohol and then drive their car. So while those other consequences are important, it's also important to remember that this can affect people's lives um, forever. So. So if you have any questions, um, again, the question box is there. Please feel free to, um, to put any questions you have in the question box. Okay, moving on to our final poll question. I'm going to launch it. So what percentage of college students meet the criteria for substance use disorder? 15.3%, um, 62.7%, 22.9%, or 
Give you about 10 more seconds. Okay, get those last minute answers in. And we're closing it. Okay, um, I'll share this real quick. So we had 13% um, um, thought that 15.3% was the percentage of college students who meet the criteria. 13% um, thought it was high at 62.7%. And then 75% said that it was 22.9% of college students who meet the criteria for substance use disorder. So I'm going to hand it off to Nelson to introduce our next um, presenter. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I'm proud to introduce Annette Newton-Baldwin. She's the Assistant Director of Programming and Outreach as well as full-time counselor at the University Counseling Center. She is a licensed professional counselor as well as a licensed marriage and family therapist Annette is a native of Slidell, Louisiana. In 1997, she earned a Master of Arts in Counseling from the University of Louisiana at Monroe. She has a special interest in substance abuse recovery counseling as well as working with trauma. Annette has been employed at Southeastern since 2003. She has worked as a grant coordinator with Transforming Youth in Recovery, National Highway Safety Commission, and Tobacco-Free Living Grants. Annette has also served as Track Coalition Chair as well as president of the Junior Auxiliary of Hammond. Annette is ARISE trained with ARISE Continuing Care with Intervention. She recently helped bring collegiate recovery programming to Southeastern Louisiana University. Lion Up Recovery is the first support program for students in recovery at a public university in the state of Louisiana. Annette continues to work with BRSSTACS Mentorship Network and the Collegiate Recovery Board members to promote sustainability of Lion Up Recovery. Thank you so much, Annette, for uh, taking the time to be with us, and uh, we'll turn it over to you. Okay. Um, so, can y'all see my screen? Um, well, we see your desktop. But not oh. the presentation. I wonder how I would pull my presentation up because I have it up on my desktop, but y'all can't see it. I wonder if it's in the other window. Yeah. If you have two screens. Yeah, she. she. Do you have two screens? I do. I wonder if it, it might be on your other screen because sometimes you can toggle between screens. If not, we can just drive. Mm -hmm. Let me see. Let me see. So if I take out the get out of, of it over here, can I get into it over here? No. Can I put it? Uh, can y'all see something now? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we can okay. see it now. <laughs> Technology. Okay. <laughs> Learning. Here we go. I don't want that there. Okay. So are we good now? Do y'all see the presentation? Yes. Yes, we are good to go. Okay, this looks good. Okay, good. Okay, so um, I'm kind of glad that y'all put me on purpose where I'm at because I feel like um, this is so appropriate because I'm actually going to talk about um, what we do um, as far as helping to prevent or change the trajectory um, that a student may be on once they start um, or if they have been engaging with substance use. So um, just, you know, whatever, introduce to myself. I've been at Southeastern now for about 17 years. Um, I do serve as the assistant director for outreach and programming. I absolutely love um, discussions, topics, interventions around alcohol and drug prevention, as well as um, my love for collegiate recovery. I absolutely love that we have Dr. Allison Smith with us tonight. 
um because i feel like we've been like co-conspirators in bringing collegiate recovery to louisiana um so i do work at the university counseling center at southeastern louisiana university so um why do we look why do we look at norms around alcohol and drug use on campus and um having worked in higher education um for for a hot minute um you know there's a lot of um i don't want to say stigma or irrational beliefs or maybe some some very interesting thoughts around alcohol and drugs and and college students um but i mean the reality is is that you know almost a quarter um of co of college students um at, could, could meet the criteria for substance use disorder now this does not necessarily mean um dependency or addiction but definitely criteria for things like binge disorder or um substance misuse disorder so um the what happens is this begins to affect um not only the safety and health of our students but it also affects the bottom line of universities um because what we also know is that it this can um bring about about a 40 percent attrition rate um because most of our, our students who leave the university about 40 percent of them leave due to substance use um issues so um i guess we kind of already looked at uh some stats and facts around um collegiate alcohol and drug use um so we have here researchers estimate that um this i think this is one of our questions researchers estimate that each year um about 1825 college students between the ages of 18 and 24 die from alcohol related unintentional injuries including motor vehicle crashes um looks that's a very large number 1,696,000. does that i wonder if that's correct um or could that be 696,000 students um, between the ages of 18 and 24 are assaulted by another student who has been drinking um, that's definitely um, when we do our core survey over here at southeastern um, we had 25.8 percent of our students in our 2019 survey reported some sort of public misconduct and underneath public misconduct um, would be like trouble with the police a dui fighting um so 25.8 percent of them admitted to public misconduct issues related you know while they were under the influence of alcohol and or drugs um so 297,000 students between the ages of 18 and 24 reporting experience alcohol related sexual assault or date rape um this is national data these these um stats on on this slide um, and about one in four college students report academic consequences from drinking, including misses, missing class, falling behind in class, doing poorly on exams or papers, um, and receiving lower grades overall. Um, so, I mean, I think part of my job or like our job is um, to kind of really fight against, um, I know like there is a, a lot of people believe, well, you know, people have to hit bottom before they change their behavior. Um, but what I, what we're kind of really up against in the last couple of years is really kind of moving towards that if we can save a young person um, any type of consequences, let's try and do that. We don't necessarily have to have somebody wreck their whole life, um, particularly while they're going to college, um, you know, just because our thinking is, is, is not correct. It's really fascinating. Um, I was listening to um, another presentation, was it last week? And the lady was saying that there's actually studies that sometimes it's safer not to attend college as far as um, alcohol and drugs go. Um, and so we don't want, you know, we don't want to deny people their education just because university life isn't safe. Um, so let, let's talk about like what we're doing over here at Southeastern. Um, so what we've implemented with um the louisiana highway safety commission is we've started doing an audit and expert interview with every student that comes through the university counseling center so this is a new endeavor we've just completed our first year 
Um, and I'm glad to report that we'll be adding um, our student advocacy department will also be doing um, the same audit and expert procedure with students that go through that department. So that's two departments on, on our campus that will be doing this process. So we're really excited. Um, so let's talk about what the audit and expert is. So the audit, audit is a very quick survey that every student takes as they come into the counseling center. So, you know, it's basic, basic questions like, um, how often do you have a drink containing alcohol? Um, how many drinks containing alcohol do you have on a typical day? There's a Likert scale to the right hand side. And um, so students fill this out and we add up the numbers. And with those numbers, there's a scale as to how we would intervene with that student. So I'll go to the next slide. Um, so students who, you know, score zero to seven are low risk and every student that talks to a counselor at the counseling center gets this conversation. So if they score seven or below, we talk about their alcohol use and if it's healthy and, and safe, then obviously we would give them encouragement. Um, when they score eight to 15, we kind of start going into motivational interviewing. And so we ask them things like, have you ever been motivated to quit? What have you tried? Would you be willing to try? And um, for those students who are completely not interested, they're like, you know, we're good. Um, we kind of ask them, well, that's fine that you're good, but we may continue to bring that up in the counseling process. Um, just to kind of check in to see if, if their thoughts or behavior, if they want to change their behaviors related to alcohol and drug use. And then scores above 16, um, we do brief intervention. And for the brief intervention, what that means at the counseling center is most likely we're gonna give them a higher level of substance abuse evaluation, which includes a subjective interview as well as the SASE, which I'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, and then obviously scores over 20 to 40, you'll absolutely get a SASE, and we're probably going to talk about a higher level of care, which may include intensive outpatient treatment or residential treatment. Um, so this is just kind of what we did in our past year. We gave um, at minimum 487 um, of our students came in. They scored seven um, points or below, so we gave them encouragement and education. Um, 54 of those students got, you know, some, some pretty good motivational interviewing and asked about, you know, whether they wanted to change their behavior or not related to alcohol or drug use. Um, and then we had four and then an additional six that we would do SASE and then two were referred to treatment. So the SASE is um, for students who score above a 15. Um, we do a SASE, which is the, um, oh gosh, I think it's the substance abuse subtle ooh, something inventory. That's really awful that I don't remember all that. Um, but it's actually um, a more comprehensive way to um, assess someone's substance use disorder. And it gives us a score of like low probability or high probability. So the next thing that we've also done on campus um, is we've added a lot more programming um, that happens every semester for those students who are, are or could be sober curious. So students have a lot more options if they are um, maybe considering or in that pre-motivational um, phase of trying to make a decision on what to do with their alcohol or drug use. Um, so this is pretty cool. We have, um, and obviously with uh, the pandemic right now, we have virtual meetings um, of Smart Recovery and Smart Family and Friends, which is um, a pretty cool, um, it's an open support group, but it really accepts people for where they are at. Um, so they don't, they're, you're not asked to um, make a decision, um, but you're supported in whatever behavior change you bring um, to the support group. So we've had some um, pretty su success over that because it really gets people to think about the purpose of their behavior, the consequences of their behavior, and maybe what it may take to create sustainable change. Um, we also host a Southeastern Recovery Night. Um, so twice a month, we do have somebody share their experience, strength, and hope. 
um, that is in recovery. Um, we tend to pick a diverse, um, we have a diversity of speakers that come in with a variety of backgrounds um, and they share um, basically how they discovered that they had a um, problem with alcohol or drugs as well as how they maintain their recovery. Um, we also host Refuge Recovery, which is the Buddhist um, spin on um, long-term recovery. And we also have a recovery book club. So, I mean, it's pretty cool that, um, I mean, I'm just, really charmed that, you know, on our campus, on our digital boards, we speak recovery here, our students see it, um, and that they know that that is a choice on our campus, which I think is awesome. Um, so let's talk about collegiate recovery. Um, so an estimated 4% of students on any given college campus identifies in recovery from, uh, from addiction. Um, when we did our core survey, it was estimated that um, it's probable that we have about 225 students in recovery um, on our campus. Um, that's of our student population. Um, we were really excited about that. Um, we currently have 10, 10 identified students who are engaged in our collegiate recovery program, um, which we launched in fall of 2019. Um, so what is collegiate recovery? Um, we were able to secure space. So our students in recovery um, actually have a gathering space on our campus. Um, we had hired a full-time coordinator in which that full-time coordinator is charged with offering the support groups. And you kind of have to think of um, specialized academic counseling related to student or specialized for students who are in recovery. So what we wanted to do is if there was a student that was attempting to maintain recovery and education and their academics, we did not want them to have to choose. So we are now creating a recovery community on our campus through all these um, things that we offer which is weekly seminar for students in recovery. Um, Pre-pandemic, we had a camping ship trip. We continue to go to the National Conference for Association of Recovery and Higher Education every year. Um, we have found, um, you know, our students, a lot of times students in recovery, they may be returning to a college campus after having to leave and go to treatment and then come back. Um, so there's, these recovery students are very, very serious about their academics. Um, so last year's GPA for our students in recovery was an, a GPA average of a 3.7, which is the national trend is that students in recovery tend to do actually better academically than um, the general population of any university. Um, we do have our space, we have a full-time uh, coordinator. Um, and then we also offer different fellowship activities, including like sober tailgating, you know, we had a Christmas party, we do um, trivia night, um, things that allow students in recovery to socialize um, without um, having to choose or between, you know, what's a safe environment and what's not, or um, having to be exposed with alcohol or drugs. So I feel like I really sped through that. So if you have any questions, please email me at recovery at southeastern.edu. Again, my name is Annette Newton Baldwin, and that's what I have. That's my presentation. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Annette. I really appreciate it. That was a great presentation. And it, yeah, like you said, it, it really follows well um, from our previous presentation. Are we doing a question? Um, I do want to mention and apologize. We were originally supposed to have Dr. Battle of uh, Tulane Public Health, but um, she was not able to take part in the uh, webinar tonight. So maybe if there's another webinar sometime, we can rope her in. But um, yeah, we apologize for that. So uh, now we're going to do our final poll question, if I'm not mistaken. No, we have no more poll questions. Um, we are going to see if any of the audience has any questions. Um, 
Logan, um, I got your email and we got your question here um, and I'll respond to you. We will, um, we'll get that contact information and set up some meetings for that class assignment. Um, so we'll get back to you on that. Anyone else have any questions? Oh, wait. Oh, thanks. Thank you for coming to our presentation. Okay. Um. Okay. Well, if there are no more questions, I just want to take this time to thank everyone for coming to our Not Another Norm public health and transportation safety webinar. Um, we really hope that you enjoyed um, our panelists, that you got great information off of it. Thank you so much to uh, Dr. Smith for um, partaking and Annette Newton-Baldwin for giving us great information on um, your respective professions, what you do at um, your jobs, at your location, as well as the um, programs that you're offering in order to kind of combat the substance abuse between our young drivers 18 to um, 25 years old. Um, I think it's really important to know that, you know, the, what we're doing or what, what everyone is doing is, you know, trying to gather data, trying to gather information so that we can allocate the right resources to, um, to, the, to the people who need them. And this way that we can combat substance abuse, because as the stats have been showing that you know, substance abuse of, among these uh, college age students um, are, it's, it's a problem. And if, if it's because they think that, because like Dr. Smith said, their five friends um, drink every day and they think that's normal and that's within their bubble, programs like this, webinars like this is to help bust those or debunk those uh, type of social norms to let you know that that is not the case. It's just those one or two or three people, everyone else, uh, you know, pretty much drinks responsibly. Also, um, this webinar is to focus on the transportation safety. The decisions that um, each person makes, that they believe they make for themselves is not just for themselves. It's also for the road around them. So people that are on the road who are abusing illegal, legal drugs and alcohol, they are also putting other people's lives into danger. And as Nelson said earlier, you know, our goal is destination zero death. And by providing education and changing driver behavior, that's how we're going to do that. So I implore you guys to, when this does come out to you, you take this webinar and use it as a resource. Um, all everyone's contact information will be on there um, so that you can learn more if you want to know more about the SASE um, programs, uh, the substance abuse um, screening intervention, or the SBIRT, or the core survey that Dr. Smith does. You'll be able to learn more about that. And if you want to volunteer or help or partner, I'm pretty sure everyone on here, this is what this is all about, networking and partnering and make sure that we um, bring those numbers down and keep everyone safe on the road, not just people in cars, but also our bicyclists, our pedestrians, everyone um, be safe on the road. So again, I want to thank you everyone so much. And if um, no one has any questions, then um, we'll go ahead and conclude the webinar. Nelson, Elizabeth, do you guys have anything you want to add to it? Um, just that once the webinar concludes and closes out, I the post survey will pop up and you can answer all the questions that we did at the beginning but now you have new knowledge and can see what we learned yes most definitely so please stick around to answer those questions for us as we say that we need that data okay well thanks well, everyone for coming Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Have a good Bye. night and put it in the